This video illustrates my preferred approach to landmark guided subcave and central line insertion. So why bother to learn a landmark guided subcaving technique? Well, there may be times when ultrasound isn't available to you. There are also times when an internal jugular line isn't feasible either. The technique is actually very simple and quick to perform, which is one of its advantages. And the subclavian line is particularly useful in trauma and out of hospital scenarios. A web search led me to this interesting uh, news article describing the rare procedure of a subclavian line. Now, I'm not sure that it was necessarily the single biggest factor in the patient's survival, but I think it's definitely a technique that deserves more attention. So why is it less popularly performed? Probably because of the fear of causing a pneumothorax. However, I hope to show you that this risk can be minimized with proper technique. There are several different approaches that have been described, and I'm just going to describe the one I've developed that works consistently for me. Start with positioning the patient. The only essential requirements here are that the patient is supine and that you have good access to the subclavian area. However, a few things will make things easier. So first, placing a small support under the scapula helps to retract the shoulder out of the way, and we will shortly see why that is important. Second, pull the shoulder down away from the head, which minimizes the chance of the guide wire not threading into the superior vena cava. I'm not sure why this maneuver works, just that it does, and perhaps this is by straightening out the vein. Placing the patient head down to fill and distend the vein will also increase the success of puncture, although one of the touted advantages of the subclavian vein is that it stays relatively open even in hypovolemic states. Now, I used to believe that head position doesn't matter so much, but a recent paper showed that the cross-sectional area of the subclavian vein was significantly increased if you turn the head slightly towards you versus neutral and especially versus contralateral. So I think the take-home message is leave the head neutral if you have to, but certainly don't turn it away from you. Now, the key landmarks I use in this technique are the sternal notch, the clavicle, and the delta pectoral triangle or groove, which is a compressible soft tissue depression just inferior to the lateral third of the clavicle. It is bordered by the deltoid muscle, pectoralis major, and the clavicle, and is our needle entry point in this approach. I place the middle finger of my non-dominant hand in the sternal notch, which is my aiming point, and my thumb in the delta pectoral triangle. The introducer needle is inserted here, literally a thumb width away from the clavicle. The key to avoiding pneumothorax is to never point the needle downwards. And this is the main pitfall with many of the techniques described elsewhere, which describe things like walking down off the clavicle. Now, if you scan the area with ultrasound, you will see that the pleura is approximately half a centimeter deeper than the axillary and subclavian vein. This is a very small margin if you angle your needle downwards, but it is more than enough to be safe if you do not. So the needle must be kept horizontal at all times, yet you must be able to get it under the clavicle. Your way to achieve this is by starting sufficiently far away from the clavicle, a thumb width away as described, inserting to first touch the clavicle and to determine its depth below the skin. Then we depress both syringe and needle as a single unit below the depth of the clavicle and advance it forward into the vein. This is illustrated here. Needle is inserted. The clavicle is touched to ascertain its depth. And then pressing down with the thumb on the needle tip and shaft and with the hand on the syringe, the entire unit is advanced parallel under the clavicle. Note that if you remain too close to the clavicle and feel yourself scraping along the underside of it, you may end up passing above the vein and missing it. It's important to be sufficiently deep under the clavicle. It is also critical that you gently apply aspiration while advancing the syringe. I recommend the following technique. Hold the barrel of the syringe firmly with the thumb, index and middle fingers and curl your ring finger around the flange of the plunger. 
pull back on it gently and constantly with the ring finger as shown here. Another key point is that counter-traction on the skin must be applied with the non-dominant hand when inserting the dilator over the guide wire. If you allow the tissues to buckle or the catheter to bend, the wire may be kinked. At no time must the dilator be allowed to bend as it is advancing through. Hold it along its shaft, not at the hub, and make short corkscrewing motions to advance the dilator cleanly through the tissues. The following three and a half minute video shows the process is in entirety. The patient has already been positioned, sight clean and draped. This position, this patient is under general anesthesia. And if you're performing this in a cautious patient, you will need a syringe with local anesthetic and a 25 gauge skin infiltration needle. The skin puncture point and subcutaneous tract of the clavicle will be infiltrated using the same needle approach as described for the actual procedure. Prepare all the essential equipment, a long introducer needle, six centimeters or so, mounted on the syringe, the guide wire with the J-tip retracted ready for insertion into the needle hub. Have a piece of gauze handy for mopping up blood. Then prime all the ports of the catheter with saline, except the one through which the wire will exit. This is the brown port in this particular catheter model. There is no point in priming or locking this as the wire will come out from the end anyway. The dilator and a scalpel for stab incision of skin around the wire or cutting stitches should be placed within easy reach. Place your middle finger in the supersternal notch and run your thumb along the clavicle to where it starts to curve and place it into the hollow of the delta pectoral triangle, roughly at the junction of the lateral third and middle third of the clavicle. With the ball of your thumb resting against the inferior edge of the clavicle, the skin puncture point is just inferior and adjacent to your thumb, approximately one and a half to two centimeters away from the clavicle. At this point in the conscious patient, you would infiltrate the skin puncture point in subcutaneous tissues all the way to the clavicle with local anesthetic. Insert the introducer needle through the skin and into subcutaneous tissue. Track the needle tip with your thumb as it is inserted and advance to gently contact the clavicle and establish its depth under the skin. Withdraw the needle slightly to disengage it from the periclavicular connective tissues and then push down with your thumb on the needle and with your other hand on the syringe so that the entire assembly remains horizontal and makes a parallel shift downwards. Hold the syringe in such a way that you can apply gentle aspiration on the plunger while retaining firm control of the syringe barrel. Advance the needle towards the sternal notch, letting it slide under your thumb, but do not let it bend. Again, remember to push down equally with the thumb on the needle shaft and with your other hand on the syringe. Advance slowly and smoothly, parallel to and under the middle half of the clavicle, aiming towards the sternal notch while keeping constant gentle aspiration on the syringe. A tactile pop in blood backflow will signal vein puncture. Anchor the hub of the needle firmly with your non-dominant hand, disconnect the syringe with a gentle twist, and check that blood is not pulsing back but flowing slowly and steadily. Thread the guide wire into the needle and the vein. There may be resistance to advancement beyond 10 centimeters or so, especially on the right side, due to the wire abutting the vein wall where it meets the brachiocephalic vein and superior vena cava. If so, it is helpful to get an assistant to gently tug on the arm and shoulder downwards. Now listen for PVCs as the wire is inserted. These are a useful confirmation that the guide wire has entered the right ventricle. It's possible that the wire may sometimes turn upwards and enter the internal jugular, in which case you won't hear the PVCs, or it may cross over to the contralateral subclavian vein. These are fortunately rare occurrences. 
complete insertion of the central venous catheter in the usual fashion. Withdraw the needle and exchange it for the dilator. Always make sure that you're keeping one hand and one eye on the wire end. As mentioned, it's critical to apply counter-traction to the skin with the non-dominant hand. Make short corkscrewing motions to advance the dilator cleanly through the tissues. It helps to hold the dilator halfway along its length rather than at the hub. At no point let the tissues buckle or the dilator bend, which will kink the guide wire as mentioned earlier. Advance the dilator to the same depth as the needle to ensure it dilates the passage all the way to the vein. A change in resistance usually signals this. Note that I did not cut the skin in this elderly patient as it was thin enough to just dilate. By not cutting, we reduce the risk of excessive bleeding at the insertion site. Withdraw the dilator. I like to compress the site with gauze to stop excessive bleeding, and then I curl the wire end into my thumb and index finger, which makes it easier to reinsert catheters over the wire. Insert a standard 15 cm length catheter to the hub. You can always pull the catheter back, but you can't advance it in once the guide wire has been removed. Unlike the internal jugular vein, there's little risk of it entering the right atrium or the ventricle with this approach. Now, another finesse tip is to withdraw the wire into the holder for neatness, in just case, in case you need it again. Confirm that blood can be freely aspirated from all ports and secure the catheter in place. A few final points to note. The distance to the vein with this approach is longer than with others. It is not unusual to insert the needle to the hub in some adult patients before a puncture is achieved. As a result, some shorter cannulas, such as the cordis swan introducer sheath, may not be long enough to reach the vein and they should not be used with this approach. The most common issue is failure to locate the vein. If the patient is very hypovolemic with low venous filling pressure, blood may not be aspirated despite puncture during advancement. So if there's been no positive aspiration and the needle has been inserted to the hub, withdraw it slowly while maintaining constant gentle traction on the plunger of the syringe. As the needle tip re-enters the vein, the withdrawing motion usually pulls the vein walls apart and the vein open, an aspiration of blood should occur. Increase head down positioning as well to maximize vein filling to the fullest extent possible. Ensure that you are not scraping along the clavicle, which may mean that you are passing between the clavicle and the vein. Finally, you may attempt redirection in first a slightly superior direction, aiming for a point along the clavicle, more lateral to the sternal notch and then in a slightly inferior direction. Arterial puncture is very rare in my experience. It has never yet happened to me. But if these steps still do not res result in success, I would move to an alternative technique. Landmark guided subclavian central lines need not be a scary technique, and they are both useful and simple to perform. Always keep these key points in mind, many of which are generic to all central line placements. Thank you for watching and I hope this helps someone somewhere sometime.